Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Maureen Conway, Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, Opportunity by Design, Growing Worker Skills and Talent in the Workplace. This conversation is part of the Economic Opportunities Program ongoing Opportunity in America discussion series in which we explore issues affecting economic opportunity in the US, the implications for workers, businesses, and communities across the country, and ideas for change. Uh, we're very grateful to Prudential Financial, Walmart, the Cerdna Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Bloomberg, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of this discussion series. And a special thank you to J.P. Morgan Chase for their support of our work on job design, uh, including the basis for today's conversation. Um, today's discussion is the second event in a set of three conversations, the job quality choice, opportunities and challenges in job design. In this series of conversation, we're examining some of the job design choices that contribute to our country's lob large share of low quality jobs and how we can design good jobs that lead to shared success among businesses and workers. Jobs that provide a family sustaining wage, opportunities for workers to grow and advance, and that have equitable and dignified workplaces where workers' voices and contributions are valued. In this second con conversation today, we will be discussing the job design, design choices employers make around developing and investing in worker skills and talents within the workplace. Many seek opportunity to grow, develop, and advance as part of their job, to have a chance to learn and build talents and apply that to the work that they're doing every day. But many workers don't receive this opportunity in their work. And this is particularly true for many frontline and lower wage workers. And these workers, as we know, are predominantly um, women and workers of color. The business costs of this approach grew over the last year as many working people left their jobs because they weren't provided this chance to grow their talents in the workplace and advance into better opportunities. So we see these uh, job design choices, as we mentioned, as good for work and, and good, for, good, good for workers and good for business as well. Uh, Work-based learning, such as apprenticeships, on-the-job training, and internships that combine working experience with skills development and learning offer a potential pathway for helping workers advance while helping business develop and retain the workforce they need. Um, and in addition, because of the demographics of the workforce, work-based learning can be a tool for advancing equity in companies. By combining earning and learning, work-based learning models offer a job design that meets um, working adults who can't afford the high cost of college and don't have really the ability to stop working and spend their time just learning. Um, so this ability to combine earning and learning is important, uh, but we also know that this approach to learning is one of the best ways that people learn by sort of learning and then applying that in their work. So what is standing an employer's way from making the choice to make these kinds of investments in their workers? What are the consequences when they don't and the rewards when they do? What job design practices and strategies can employers use in developing work-based learning initiatives? Um, and what are the opportunities and limitations of work-based learning in helping workers to obtain high quality jobs? So we have a great set of folks to talk about this with us today. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Uh, quickly, I will review our technology for the, uh, everybody is muted. Um, we really welcome people's questions. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit or upvote questions. Um, we know that many people in our audience are also expert in this uh, area and uh, may have ideas, examples, resources, or experiences to contribute to the conversation. Please do share those in the chat. We also always appreciate your feedback. So please take a moment to respond to our quick feedback survey at the end of this session. We're really thrilled with the participation in today's event. Uh, thank you to many of you who submitted questions in advance. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, we also encourage you to tweet about this conversation. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please do uh, message us in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. The uh, event is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website. Closed captions are also available for this discussion. Please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to use those. Okay, and now it is my great pleasure to welcome our panel and moderator. Uh, you can find more information about them on our website in the interest of time. I'm not gonna go into detail. Um, I will just put sort of names to faces. So with us today, we have Daniel Bustillo, 
Executive Director of the Healthcare Career Advancement Program, uh, HCAP, uh, Joyce Lynn Caldwell, Vice President of Workforce Strategy and Organizational Growth at Walmart, Kim Gregory, Head of the Business Program Office for Talent Development and the Global Career Experience, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, Paul Osterman, um, oh gosh, Paul, I just can't say that, Nan Yang, Technical University Professor of Human Resources and Management at MIT Sloan School of Management. Should have asked you about the uh, pronunciation there. Um, and we're very thrilled today to have Abba Badarai to moderate today's conversation. Uh, Abba is the economics correspondent at Washington Post, where she writes about housing, jobs, inequality, and workers' issues. So she's the perfect choice to moderate this conversation. Uh, but before I turn it over to Abba, we've asked Paul to kick off today's conversation by sharing some of his recent research that he's done uh, looking at this issue of skills and employer investment in skills. So Paul, let me turn it over to you. Uh, th thank you, Maureen, and thank you, fellow panelists and everyone out there in uh, TV land. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to just give you some very quick data from a new survey that I did on the extent of employer-provided training and who doesn't get it and who does get it and what people want and how they assess it. And then I'll discuss briefly uh, what I think are some of the kind of the key things to think about or to worry about in this arena. And then I will stop. And, I, and even though I'm an academic, I'm actually capable of stopping talking uh, at some point. And, and that point will be fairly, fairly, fairly soon. So uh, let, let me begin uh, with the data. So uh, I, I'm assuming everyone out there can see that. So what I'm going to do it turns out that the federal government stopped collecting data on uh, employer-provided training sometime during the Reagan administration. And there's actually no good nationally representative data on this topic. There is something called the ATE, the Adult Training and Education Survey, but it focuses only on credentials and not on employer training. So I went out there and did the survey. Uh, the survey was done in 2022 using uh, the NORAC AmeriSpeak panel. It's for adults. It was done in English and Spanish. It's a pretty good sample size. And you can see who the nice people were who funded it. I'm going to only show you three slides from this. There's a gazillion other pieces of data that I could, I could show you on this topic. In fact, I'll mention something at the end. So the first kind of just question is, among the American workforce in 2020, the American adult workforce, who received, uh, how many people received training from employers and who were those folks? So overall, you can see among all employees, uh, about 59% uh, received uh, employer training in, 20, in the 12 months prior to the survey. And among new hires, it was about three quarters. You know, there's no way of knowing whether that's a good number or a bad number, whether the glass is half full or half empty, but it's not trivial, right? Uh, the problem is, as Maureen indicated, that it's not equitably distributed. So if you have a college degree or more, as you can see on this slide, you're far more likely to get training from your employer than you are if you have a high school degree or less. And this is really where, where the, problem, uh, the problem lies. The survey asked people, uh, what was, uh, what did, uh, thinking back on their, on their career, what was the most important source of their skills? Where did they get their skills from? What, did, what would they rank number one? Uh, number one was friends and colleagues. Now, friends and colleagues uh, includes colleagues at work. So in some sense, at least some of these folks are talking also about uh, training at the workforce. But close on the heels of friends and colleagues was employer-based training. And these two considerations simply dominate relative to every other venue for training. Four-year colleges come next, followed by online, community colleges, for-profit schools, and job training programs. But people rank employer-based training basically as number one in terms of uh, importance to them. Last slide. Uh, we asked people, if you wanted to get more training from your employer, would, that, would it be available to you? Again, you see a terrifically large, uh, unfortunately large disparity. 65% uh, of people with a college degree or more say that if they wanted to get more training from their employer, uh, they could. 
and only about 47% of high school folks say the same thing. So there's clearly, clearly a large gap um, in an equity gap with respect to uh, training. So what, what can we make of this? Now, I'm gonna show you one more slide. When we get to the discussion, I should say, I, I, could, I could fill up the next six hours with slides from the survey, but the one additional slide I will show you uh, will be on how much kind of uh, work-based learning goes on in schools. And I'll come, we can come back to that. Um, what do we make of this? Well, the research evidence is quite clear that employer-based training pays off. The rate of return to employer-based training is high. It's high both for the workforce and it's high uh, for employers too with respect to quality of their products, services, and productivity. So what's going on? Why are we worried besides the equity thing? Well, there's a reason to worry about what's going on because of several considerations. One is over time, the kind of human resource function in organizations has weakened. Uh, human resource is largely outsourced in many places now. And even where it's not outsourced, uh, the, 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 the finance function, the operations function dominates in terms of internal organizational power relative to the human resource function, not to mention what used to be called the industrial relations function. Neither of these are, are powerful in organizations anymore. Training is typically seen as a soft expense that is, is, is a variable cost and can be easily cut uh, with little consequence. And there's a considerable temptation inside of organizations to rely on the public public sources of training, right? To, to put the burden on schools, to put the burden on community colleges, put the burden on four-year schools, as opposed to on themselves. And this represents quite a considerable change over the last 20 or 30 years in terms of employer's sense of responsibility uh, for training. There tends to be a, a, also a sense to underestimate the contribution that frontline workers can make to the success of organizations. Uh, and you see that in a lot of different ways. But, but uh, I did a lot of work, Daniel will appreciate this, I did a lot of work on home health aids. And if you talk to hospitals, if you talk to insurance companies, constantly denigrating the contribution of those folks to the, to the performance of their organization. And that's true across the board. So just some quick thoughts on how you can think about fixing this. I mean, one way to think about fixing this problem is jawboning. That is to say, prestigious people, president of the United States, heads of business organizations, heads of unions, uh, an occasional random academic, uh, talk about the importance of, of skills, the importance of training. And that makes some difference in the kind of the atmosphere around these issues. It does. I think it'd be, it. I think it's a mistake to think none of that counts, but it's not going to really turn turn the ship around. Uh, changing the structure of the tax system to incentivize employers to invest more in training is another way to go. And providing incentives, so-called on-the-job training incentives, uh, is another way to go. Money, money, money. Right. Uh, the final way to go is something that I've done a lot of work on and a lot of people are on this panel and a lot of people at Aspen have done a lot of work on, which is how you think about integrating job training programs and community colleges, uh, union management partnerships in a way that provides uh, support to employers who may want to invest in training, right? Because um, if, if, if training is seen as kind of a second level issue inside of organizations, you can try and reduce the costs and increase the perceived benefits if there's an outside organization who can work with the employer to help identify people, to support people, to provide best practice examples of training. And I've worked with, and other people around this panel and, and at Aspen have worked with a number of best practice training organizations that work effectively with employers. So I think that's fun, the kind of fundamental challenge is not to kind of wring our hands over the maldistribution of access to training, but to think about you know, where the policy le levers are to do something about it. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, that was fantastic. I think that provides a, a lot of, uh, for this panel to consider and talk about. Um, and so without further ado, Abba, I am going to turn it over to you to, to get started at everybody some questions. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for 
a conversation that seems to be getting more important by the day. Um, we are two and a half years into this pandemic and we've seen major shifts in how employees and employers view their relationships to work. We're seeing um, very acute labor shortages across industries and all of the challenges that come with that, you know, of attracting employees, of keeping employees. And so I'm really thrilled to be talking about how workers can not only, how, how employers can not only create jobs, but good jobs that actually allow workers to thrive and to flourish. Um, so I would love to get started here with you, Jocelyn. And I'm wondering, you know, so Walmart is the country's largest private employer. How are you guys thinking about promoting employee talent and skills and why is that important to the business? Well, I'll start off with saying that um, for Walmart, we've, we've had a history, I would say, of mobility within the company. If you look at the stats, 75% of our salary managers started off as hourly associates. So in a lot of respects, we always knew that we needed to tap into our internal talent. Um, and provide paths for opportunities for them. The question is, is how can we take what was happening organically and really be a little bit more intentional about it? And so in 2016-ish, um, around that time, but a little bit few years before then, we started you know, implementing what we call Walmart Academies in our markets and in our regions across the nation. So that grew to about 200, and pl 200 plus of those. But what we're finding is that not everyone was able and taking advantage of those academies. So during, you know, during the times where we were really um, seeing, just like everyone else, labor shortages, what we've also done was we began investing. Paul, I think you talked about this. How can we invest in our associates that want to go back and get a certificate, that want to go back and complete a four-year degree or a two-year degree? So we started paying 100% of um, of that cost through um, what we call Live Better You. But we, we couldn't stop there because now we're diversifying. We've got the academies, we're helping um, with certif certificates as well as with college or higher ed. Um, but then the question becomes, what if, what if neither one of those are options? And we are finding that we had labor shortages in some, you know, some areas like truck drivers. So recently, I don't know if you've heard, but you know, we have now a 12-week development program where you can opt into the 12-week program. And out of that, it's almost like a boot camp. Then you become a truck driver, which we were having major shortages. And it increases your economic mobility because now you're going maybe from an hourly associate to a um, to a wage or to a job that's paying you know over 100k a year. So we're constantly evolving and diversifying. Um, and at the end of the day, we're doing it so that we can provide a path for opportunity and growth for everyone. Uh, but I think you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> oh, man, we're only like 10 minutes into this. All right. <laughs> I'm going to stay off mute now. Um, Daniel, I wanted to move on to you. Uh, tell us a bit about what you do at HCAP and how conversations like this one on worker skills development sort of fit into the national discourse on job quality and perhaps more importantly, equality. Yes, I uh, appreciate the question. And uh, thanks to Maureen and the team at Aspen for hosting this as well. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and Paul, thank you for lifting up what you talked about related to home health aides. I think we could talk about uh, other members of the direct care workforce and how they're undervalued as well. And we certainly will. So uh, just a little bit about HCAP. Um, HCAP is a national labor management organization of SEIU locals and healthcare employers that are partnering on developing high quality workforce and educa education and training options across all sectors of healthcare, right? So hospitals and health systems, nursing homes and home care. Uh, our labor management training partnerships work primarily but not exclusively with incumbent healthcare workers. And I'll reference that in a second. Um, collectively, our network spans 16 states plus DC, almost a thousand employers, over 550,000 covered workers, and over 100,000 workers a year accessing some form of training across a wide spectrum of options, right? From occupation specific to career advancement, which really enables a majority women and black and brown frontline healthcare workforce. Many of them also immigrants working in lower wage occupations 
access to training benefits that are negotiated through collective bargaining agreements. So we take a step back. Healthcare is obviously a large sector for employment with continued projections for occupational growth, but it's also a sector that suffers from job quality issues and occupational segregation with a really severe overrepresentation of black and brown women caregivers, many of the same caregivers that Paul was referencing in lower wage occupations. You know, if we look at the history of our labor management training partnerships, as a matter of fact, the first one incepted in New York City over 50 years ago was really a direct outgrowth of the civil rights movement, um, really designed to address many of the same issues that remain endemic in healthcare. So at HCAP, as both a policy and program delivery organization, our mission is really to promote job quality and equity for the healthcare workforce through high road training partnerships and strategies that are focused at the intersection of what we're here talking about today, right? So educational attainment, but also racial and gender equity and job quality. And we have a long history and orientation towards collaboration on the development of supply and demand side workforce solutions that really do equally center the needs of workers as true co-partners and, and directly take into account the voice of workers who too often ha have limited agency and are not part of the development process even though they oftentimes have a great deal of untapped experience and expertise. So finally, on the question of national discourse, I think this conversation is an excellent, important fit as you know, workers oftentimes self-identify access to educational advancement opportunities as a core component of a good job. But the details of such are really important so that we're not simply pursuing learning for learning's sake, but that we're, we're really helping to foster a fundamental shift in worker skills development orientation towards one that is much more explicitly grounded in the production of good jobs and fostering equity, and away from one that has, I think, by and large, placed a disproportionate burden on workers themselves for that development as well. So looking forward to the conversation today. Perfect. Uh, Kim, let's turn to you next. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do at JP Morgan, about your role there, and how you're thinking about talent development, particularly when it comes to frontline workers? Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So first of all, I have the opportunity to lead our talent development, as well as our career experience here at JP Morgan Chase, which is truly an honor when we think about the 250,000 plus employees that benefit from that. So when I, when I think about what we're trying to do, uh, I, I have a t-shirt that I had made that I often walk around wearing, which is hashtag jobs. Because in, in, in the world that I sit in, I think what we've got to do is one, when we think about listening to our employees, employees don't want to do things that don't lead to jobs. And so why would we have career development that doesn't lead to a job? And you're going to hear me say that a lot today, because if there's not a job at the end, then it's, it's sort of this in vain activity. And when we think about the ecosystem that we live in today, uh, we could all look and see that in, in the estimates that are out there that we've got you know, 375 million workers that are estimated to need new or upgrade their skills by, by 2030. That's no different any of the spaces that we work in. And so when I think about talent development at J.P. Morgan Chase, we are committed to and we look at our employees and say, how do we help them be ready for those changes? Because employees know that there are changes in the digital space, the technical skills they need, the professional skills they need, and then the day-to-day -day skills they're going to need, they're going to change as technical evolution continues to change the way that we interact with our customers. So we know we have really smart people here. We know that they want to do well. And so what we look to do is figure out how can we, in all of the programming that we have, put in front of them options that help them be better in the role that they're in today and be better for tomorrow. The way that I always look at it is hire someone for their first job, train them for their second or third and their fourth. And so that requires programming that's constantly being touched, constantly being altered. And it's not about what I think, it's about what employees are saying. And that's how we should be looking at these talent development programs. Perfect. That's actually a great segue to our next topic, which is what these ideas look like in practice. I'm hoping we can get some specific examples on sort of how you guys structure these programs and how you gauge success, because you know this is not sort of a one size fits all strategy and I'm sure you're constantly having to calibrate and adjust. Uh, Daniel, let's start with you. Um, and I want to talk specifically about apprenticeships. 
what do you define as a quality and effective program? Give us some examples. I know many companies are just starting to get started in this space. Um, what do you look for for a successful apprenticeship program? Yeah, so if we think about the healthcare sector, we have a long history of apprenticeship-like training models, but a very short history of any sort of formal uptake of the registered apprenticeship process as we know it. So um, that's something that over the past six, seven years with sort of the federal investment, there have been greater efforts to expand into non-traditional industries. So I think from our perspective, when we think about the fact that um, we were certainly seeing a situation where the accessible career mobility options for healthcare workers are becoming increasingly difficult, right? We talk quite frequently about pathways, but when we actually look at the number of folks who are able to progress along those pathways on an annual basis, relatively small as well. Um, so, you know, the, there are some core components of a registered apprenticeship program. It was already attractive because of some of the mandated components of a registered apprenticeship program. Things such as the fact that it's a paid job from inception, right, with requirements around a wage progression for competence, competency attainment. So, uh, as I referenced before, before, not simply learning for learning's sake, but tangible benefits and protections for workers in those programs and a benefit to the employers as well. Uh, other important components in my estimation in defining a quality and effective program, and some of these are from my perspective in the healthcare sector and the work that we do and how we're structured. But when thinking about the ecosystem of partnerships, certainly it's important to have uh, supply and demand side stakeholders be part of that process and equal co-partners and part of that process. In healthcare, we think supporting competency-based programs. That's the tack that we've taken. And we think that's the, that definitely is uh, from a quality perspective, the way to go. I think um, a clear and well-defined alignment and interaction between what's called an apprenticeship related technical instruction, basically the classroom component and the on the job learning component as well. Those two should be an interaction well aligned and supporting each other throughout the process to really support adult learners. Uh, third, I would say a strong and structured mentorship component. Uh, mentorship is a key consideration and differentiator for a registered apprenticeship program. And it's not only a benefit to the apprentice, but if we take a step back and think about it, really a benefit to the mentors as well who should be compensated for their work as mentors as well. Then fourth, I would say, they should be truly debt-free. We oftentimes hear about the apprenticeships as debt-free. They should be truly debt-free. There are some models that have been built up where that's not necessarily the case. Um, fifth, the necessary supportive services, which we oftentimes talk about, not just childcare and transportation, but those things that really do impede, in addition to those two really important considerations that really impede um, someone's progress in programs. Fifth, worker voice, right? So the example that I'm gonna lift up as well is, um, a partnership that we work with out in Washington State as part of our network. Um, there was a healthcare apprenticeship consortium out there that with the sponsor is one of our labor management training partners, the SAU Healthcare 1199 Northwest Multi-Employer Fund. It's a multi-union, multi-employer registered apprenticeship program that is open to employers in the state of Washington as well, right? But workers themselves are integral components of not only of program oversight, but also informing the development of the models themselves as well, right? So you have experienced people that are actually informing the development of the programs too. So true mechanisms for worker voice. I think those are some of the key considerations when I think about sort of quality apprenticeship programs. Perfect. Can you elaborate a bit about the competency-based program? What does that look like and how is that different from other styles? Yeah, I mean, the, our, all our models, all our registered apprenticeship models that we have developed are competency based. There's still a little bit of a gray area as how that relates to registered apprenticeship, but it's really that uh, you should progress in the program based upon your ability to demonstrate competency attainment, as opposed to how long you are in a particular program. Mm -hmm. Right. So we think that that's certainly for especially when you think about incumbent workers with a lot of potential experience in healthcare. That is certainly something that should be, you should they should be rewarded for their experience and knowledge and the competencies competencies they've attained through previous experience as healthcare workers. Fantastic. Um, Kim, I love what you said about hiring people for their first job and then training them for subsequent ones. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit 
sort of about your framework for frontline workers. How did you guys come up with this strategy and how have you developed it to what it is today? Yeah, so I hear Daniel saying uh, the worker voice a lot. And I would say that everything for me always starts with the employee's voice. And, and I know it drives my team crazy, but when they come to me with a great idea, I always say, is that you sitting around in a room coming up with that? Or did you talk to people that actually do the jobs and understand what they're looking for and what they need? And that is really how this all started. The work that I do actually was, uh, wasn't in existence a few years ago at the level that we're, we're engaged now. And we sat down and said, gosh, we're doing a lot of work in a number of different ways. So let's go find out what employees are saying and spent time with hundreds of our frontline workers, just talking to them about you know, what they needed, what were the blockers, et cetera. And people told me the same thing, no matter what city I was in, no matter what type of facility I was in for JP Morgan Chase. And our frontline workers really said to me, Kim, I know the world is changing. I know I need new skills, but even if I knew what those skills were, I don't know how to go get them and I don't know what it means once I get them, so help me. And that was really the basis of programming that, that we did, which led into also having conversations with business leaders about, hey, how are you gonna help us, help your employees be able to get through programming, have time to take programming, be able to engage, and then how are you gonna help them through mentorships, through uh, utilizing our HR talent um, pieces to drive people into new roles. I do think that uh, Daniel mentioned that Paul had some, some commentary around, I, I wrote it down here, the burden is on schools versus the organization. And I think one of the things that we also did I think was important was when we think about what I said about jobs, we had to internally say our programs need to be targeted at pointing people on pathways that lead to that job. But there's also an onus on us to be working with educational institutions to say, hey, here's what we're looking for. So we did some work where we built out some knowledge, skills, and abilities that were necessary for some worker on data and analytics roles. And we didn't do that with, with, we did that, we didn't do that alone. We did it with the leaders in those businesses. And then we worked with schools and said, all right, here's what we need. What do you have in the form of curriculum? And if they didn't, we'd say, hey, well, we want to let you know, this is the kind of curriculum that we need. How, how can we make that happen so that then the students we have can come into your educational institutions, get the certificate and or degrees that will drive them into those roles. And I think that was really important. And, and it's led us to have uh, statistics that show us as people participate in the programming, the propensity for them to get a new job is double what it is if they don't participate in the program. So we know that if you, if you build it, they will come. And, and then if you build the right programming, it leads to jobs. Perfect. Can you tell us a bit about who the frontline workers are that you guys, you know, when you say frontline workers at J.P. Morgan Chase, who are you talking about? And then what are some of the pathways yeah. that are available to them? What sort of jobs can they work up to? Yeah, so I think we have a, a, a ton of variants, right? We're such a big organization. We have entry level data and analytics um, opportunities. We have entry level within our branch network. We have entry level within our call centers. We have entry level within our back office. We have, I mean, there's just a host of of uh, roles. What I would say is this, we've also done a lot of work internally to build out a system that allows an employee to go in and assess themselves against, against the set of capabilities. And we know that those capabilities, they have five varied levels, but we know that they go across 80% of the roles within J.P. Morgan Chase. And so if you go in and you say, gosh, I'd like to get better at data literacy. Who couldn't be better at data literacy? All of us could get better at that. I want to get better at that. You can assess yourself and then learning begins to be sent to you automatically within 24 hours. We're continuing to get better at that. But when I think about it, that allows employees across the firm to have access to programming. It's not done by line of business, which I think is also helpful in giving opportunities across and, and in varied spaces within the firm. Great. Um, Jocelyn, I'm wondering if you can talk to us about Walmart Academy. Um, what have you guys noticed since you first set it up and how do you how do you assess success? How do you know whether things are working? What sort of metrics do you look at? And how do you make sure this is something that's working for both workers and for the business? Yes, and I think the point Ava, that you asked about how do we ensure that it's working for workers? 
and the business. I want to emphasize that because I think oftentimes we think about um, the investment that we're making in our frontline workers. Yes, we want to invest in them, but it also helps us better serve our customers and it's, um, and it's good business as well. So for Walmart Academy, there are a couple of things that we that we've learned along the way. One is is personalize the experience for our associates. We've talked, Kim, you've talked about, you know, what is what is the associate saying? What are the employees saying? Meet them where they are. And first of all, we want the our associates to be able to do the job that they're doing and learn in the job that they have today. So what we've done and will continue to do is leverage technology. It's amazing how something as simple as a mobile handheld in, in the hand of an associate so that they can understand and they can learn how to do their job that they have now and do that well. But then it also offers opportunity for learning, offering up job prompts. It also helps them understand what are possible career paths, but not only the career paths, what are the skills that I need to, to have developed to be a lot to go along that path? So it goes back to meet them where they are and start in the job that they have today. Then it can evolve from that, right? Now we have our, I talked about our academies, we're moving to a global academy. Um, we have 2.3 million employees or associates. So now there's just a many different ways that you can leverage because we're so diverse. So we have the, the jobs that we have today, but what about those skills for tomorrow? So what we're finding is identifying the skills and capabilities that you need for tomorrow. An example of this is two or three years ago, who would ever thought that we needed in-home delivery? So that's a business need that we have that we translate that into, you know, providing development for our associates. These are new jobs. These are new roles, which requires new skills. So now we are able, as part of Walmart Academy, um, to upskill our associates so now that they are able to be um, to have access to those jobs and those opportunities. And from there, how do we then buttress this with, I want to move into leadership. So we're finding that in our Walmart Academy, we are also leaning in to leadership development in many different ways. Some of it is virtual. Some of it's going to be part of brick and mortar. But if you think about the outcome that we're trying to achieve is not development for development's sake, but development so that the associate can move and pro can progress in the organization. And we are seeing that that um, that having those diverse pathways are working. Fantastic. Um, Paul, I want to bring you back into the conversation here. Uh, your research looks into how employers develop or help their employees develop skills and sort of, you know, lays the groundwork for higher quality jobs and better business performance. Can you give us some examples of companies that have done this especially well and some pointers for what other businesses can learn from them? Uh, sure, but let me, as a good, as a good, if you don't mind, as a good politician, say thank you so much for that question. I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Because I've been watching the news, I know how to do it. And then I'll come back to that question, okay? I just want to say, make a couple of comments and then give you two more quick data slides. The comments are, I think what we've heard are examples of really committed organizations. Uh, but keep in mind, we're in an amazingly difficult, different, unusual point in a business cycle, right? The tightest labor market since who knows when. It's not always going to be that way. And so I think the challenge for organizations is going to be how you institutionalize the commitment to training so that it survives the business cycle, right? So that's not something that's happening today, but is not happening when the labor market turns down. And uh, you know, I think that's really an important an important consideration. Um, I guess the second kind of just general comment I want to make is that uh, it's important, and and I think everyone recognizes this not just to train people to do a better job at the job they're doing today, but to build ladders inside of organizations. And part of the function of the, uh, the job of the training function is to create those ladders and to create them as internal 
as opposed to hiring only people from from the outside. So there, there's kind of kind of structural challenges that um, people people need to face. Now, the, if you give me one more minute, the 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 discussion has been about work-based learning and also about credentials. I'm going to give you two more very fast slides because those are the two buzzwords out there right now, uh, occupational-based credentials and workplace-based learning. Let me show you how rare that is in the labor market today. Both of those are, are rare in the labor market today. So the survey did ask people, uh, did you do any work-based learning? Uh, while you were in community college, four-year college, or, or a for-profit organization? Did you also work at an organization as part of that educational experience? Overall, only 16% of people answered yes to that. And this includes apprenticeships, right? Because apprenticeships are an example of work-based learning. Again, there's a tremendous disparity by, by education level. Uh, the survey also asked, do you have an industry-certified occupational credential? There are about a quarter of the people do have that, but again, there's tremendous uh, disparity by education. So these kind of buzzwords, and I don't mean that really in totally, I don't mean that in a negative way, but they are kind of ideas de jour, uh, haven't really caught on at scale yet. And I think, I think that that is a significant challenge. As far as the best organizations that are, uh, you know, are, doing, are doing this kind of thing now, I mean, I, I, I very much respect what, what Walmart Academy is doing. I very much respect what, what Amazon is doing for, for its warehouse workers. I very much respect what 1199 SEIU has done around the country for, for healthcare workers. Um, what tends to be missing in all these discussions about these best practices is, is our data. You know, I mean, I mean, I, you know, a, a couple of slides <laughs> on how many people and how many, how, what they learned and what happened to them afterwards for all of them, for all these efforts, I think would, would help a lot in terms of the conversation. Um, other best practice examples and kind of the high road discussion often tend to be idiosyncratic companies that are owner owned or are unusual in, in, in some particular way. I think the really important question is for for publicly traded large organizations, what what's what does best practice look like at scale? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have a good grip on that in ways that look that we can kind of quantify yet. Perfect. And actually, this is a great segue to a few viewer questions that we've gotten. You mentioned Amazon. You mentioned Walmart. These behemoth companies. But what can small businesses do? What resources and um, the support is available to them if they want to invest in their employees? So, I'll, I'll, so, so small businesses that I've looked at and talked to can be effective on this if they work through local industry associations. So, so a great example of this in various parts of the country is the machine tool industry, where there's a very, where the national, I'm going to get it wrong, but machine tool association. Uh, has local chapters and often work with high schools and community colleges to design uh, entry points and apprenticeship programs and work shadowing. So the trick for small businesses, I think, is to kind of, I, this is a politically charged word, is to collectivize because you're worried about poaching, right? If a small business makes a big investment in, in training, you worry that a large firm is going to come along and grab that person. And, but if, if, if small businesses operate through associations or groups with a, with a job training program or a community college or a four-year school as a focal point, then they can avoid that kind of risk and, and, and essentially achieve scale. Great. Daniel, do you want to contribute to that? Do you, do you have a sense of what small businesses can do to make this a successful partnership? Uh, no, not, nothing to add beyond what, what sort of Paul laid out as well too. I mean, I think we do have, it's a difficult conversation. We think about the healthcare sector. We do not have 50 state employers in the healthcare sector as an example. Um, two considerations. One is that we do have many smaller firms, but we also have, you know, funded through government funding as well, right? So that's an entirely other layer of the conversation that I think is an important consideration. And, you know, I'll come back to, I think at the end to some of the points that Paul made, which I think are important considerations and important points to bring up in terms of thinking about where are we going next? Great. Uh, so on the flip side of this, we've talked a lot about the benefits of these programs, but there are also challenges that come with them. And I'm wondering if we could dive into that a little bit, how do you stop and assess and then, 
adjust as necessary. Um, Kim, I'll start with you in this one. And I'm wondering, you know, there's so many, there's so many examples of employers trying these sorts of work-based learning programs and then finding that there are glitches along the way. Maybe workers go through this training and then they just find there's no reward for their skills. It's not necessarily tied to a job um, they can immediately take. Or maybe there are time constraints, there are financial issues that sort of cause things to fizzle out. And I'm wondering what some of the obstacles you have that you've encountered in this space and how you guys have addressed this. Everything you just said. And so I think to start this conversation, I think one of the most important things to think about when we think about adult learners is the number one reason, and jo Jocelyn touched on this a bit in the beginning, but I want to bring it back to the forefront. The number one reason why an adult learner does not go back and get their education is money. It's the lack of funding. And so I think that that's really important as you're bringing forward programming. How are you supporting that being at no cost to your employees? And I'll come back to that in a minute. But when I think overall, when I think about things that were obstacles or blockers, the first thing for me was we had to really recognize that what got us here wouldn't get us there. That, like what, what got us to today wasn't going to get us where we wanted to go. And for a lot of reasons, one, the turnover of skills today is so fast and, and you've just got to be able to keep up with it. And I had written down a couple of things. And the ability for skills to become a currency across your firm and then external to your firm, too, if somebody decides to leave. So I've gained the skill. What does that mean and how can I utilize it? I think those are some of the things that become very difficult to quantify or, or the word I always use is give it currency. I also think that making this concept of continuous learning a part of our everyday DNA, making it a part of our performance, making it a part of our hiring practices, making it a part of our job descriptions, making it a part of everything we do from a management leadership standpoint is hard. And it takes every single day going out there and hitting the pavement and talking to people and letting them know the benefits of when we help an employee to have these opportunities, what does that mean for them as they contribute back to the organization? And we know that employees are more engaged. We know that employees perform better. We know that employees are less likely to attract. So all those things come with benefits. I would also say that designing the, you know, designing programs that are, to the point you were making around time, et cetera, designed for adult learners. Saying to a frontline worker, oh, we're going to have a program across the street at so-and-so university, so you can go at four o'clock today. That's not, that's not feasible. That does not work. That, that limits, you just removed all equity across your ability to provide for the adult learner. And then the last thing I'd say that I wouldn't say it's a blocker, it was an opportunity. I try to look at everything as being half full. An opportunity that we saw was some of our internal policies and how could we change? It took me a long time, by the way. It was like a personal, like knocking on doors, we're going to get this done. How, there were policies that we looked at and said, these are barriers to entry for employees, whether it be your background, like there could be a number of reasons. And so how do we remove those barriers? And so we changed five of our internal policies to allow for employees to have the opportunity that they may not have even considered prior because they saw this in some way, shape, or form as being a blocker. Perfect. Jocelyn, um, I'll go to you next. Walmart has more than 2 million employees all over the world, but a lot of this employee talent development is done at the local level or the regional level. Can you tell us a bit about sort of how you balance those two things? How do you work within the community, but also, you know, in this larger national or international framework? Yeah, I would say the way that we've done it is you need to create local based community solutions as well as what I would call enterprise solutions that kind of meet in the middle. So what we found is that Oftentimes, when you start from the top down or the enterprise solution, you are designing for scale. And so sometimes you're missing what that community has available, what that local market needs. And so you have to shift the paradigm a bit and start with, you know, what are the clubs and stores in certain communities? What are the roles? What are their needs? What are those associate needs? And then I think, Paul, you mentioned this then what you'll find out is there are many strategic partners that you can leverage within those communities like 
um, workforce development um, partnerships that we've made, um, as well as um, those that are offering boot camps and apprenticeships. But they're not necessarily nationwide or across the United States. They're, they tend to be within those local communities. So how can you develop um, your needs and conduct a needs analysis so that those local talent developers can consume it. And that's one of the things that we had to really work toward, and we are still doing that, so we can disaggregate the data and the demand such that we understand by location and, lo and community what it is, so then we can better leverage those local community partnerships that we have. Uh, but I think you're on, you're on mute again. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you talked earlier about how many businesses still aren't making this, these investments and they just haven't sort of come around to this. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. Why, why is there hesitation to invest in worker training development programs and what are some strategies around that? Right. So I, I don't think there are any businesses that do of any of a you know, reasonable scale that don't do it. That do no training. The, the problem, the problem is where is that training directed? And is it is it directed entirely at, at senior folks? Is it directed entirely at people with college degrees? Or does it go to, to a frontline workforce of various kinds? And then secondly, does it has the organization built job ladders? So again, to pick on the on the healthcare sector, because it's a sector where there's tremendous opportunities for job ladders because uh, it's such a large hierarchical set of organizations, is it possible to go from the laundry or from the kitchen and to become a healthcare technician? Have you built those kinds of ladders? So the real question isn't how come they don't do any training, it's to whom is the training directed and what kinds of ladders are available? Part of it is cultural or kind of ideological or conceptual, whatever word you want to use, namely kind of a, a lack of respect for what frontline workers could be or could do if they were given the opportunity. Partly is the lack of advocates within the organization. So, so who are the advocates within the organization? Well, traditionally, historically, the advocates were unions, but, but unions are not in most organizations now. Uh, other advocates could be a very strong human resource function, but now human resource in most organizations, human resources is not a strong function. Uh, frontline managers are interested in what they in getting the job done today, right? And and so that's their that's their orientation. You can understand that completely, but they're not necessarily interested in building talent over a long period of time in the organization. So there aren't strong internal advocates. And there aren't really strong external pressures on organizations to to change. So uh, this combination of kind of cultural I, I, I don't know what the right word is, but I don't want to sound political, but cultural, ideological, kind of bad lack of respect for what people could do, com lack of respect for the contribution they could make to the success of the organization, combined with lack of advocates with, in the organization, combined with kind of the pressures for immediate performance and training is a long-term investment, adds up to challenges. Uh, but can I chime in there for a second? Because I, I think too, Paul, there's this side there of one of the things that we did to help bring it forward was we started with leadership and really got their buy-in. But then after that came in and started to marry, all right, we have all these people and they're taking advantage of either internal or external resources to go and get fully funded degrees and or certificates. But then to say, hey, we're pointing them towards in-demand jobs within the firm that we know we have openings for. So how do you marry that data? And I think data has really been a gift to help us to drive more opportunities. I also think that one thing we haven't talked about today that I was reminiscing as we were talking um, here about something that I spoke to a few years ago is we give people all this training, but then we don't teach them how to go and get their resume updated yes. or how to do an interview properly or how to show up and say, well, I learned this and then here's how I applied that skill. And, and I have a 17 year old and I, I, he, got, he got a job over the summer and he's coaching a little boy in golf. He's on the golf team at school. He's coaching a little boy in golf. And so I sat down one day and said, hey, what are the skills that you picked up? 
And he looked at me like I had a third eye on my head, right? He's like, what do you mean, the skills I picked up? I said, well, tell me what you do with Nicholas. Oh, you do that with Nicholas? Okay, so how'd you bring that forward? And how would you talk about that? And how is that changing? How? And it was this conversation, but those are the kind of things we need to do in the workplace. And, and I use that example because you know, it, it, it's easy to talk about him, but it's important because if someone gets all these skills and they can't articulate it, it doesn't help them move forward. And that's on us to help them. Right. I completely agree. And, and, but then the issue becomes, and I'm not saying this is a problem in your organization, who's going to do that? And, for, I don't, I, and that means where is the organization going to devote resources to it? Yeah. And, and so then the organization, well, who's going to be resistant to directing resources towards it? And remember, and then you know this better than I do, the CEO can say, this is a fantastic idea, but three levels down, it's somebody else who actually has to make it happen and be willing to direct resources towards it. Yeah. And Paul, if I could just, Ava, can I jump in? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, <laughs> so to jump into the conversation, that's why I think that we need to do a better job showing ROI. Because it, Kim, you make, you make a great point, right? We have all of these openings We've invested in our associates, but we're not matching the two. So if you think about, you know, the cost of a vacancy, the cost of hire, hiring externally, you can easily build, and we have built the business case that says, hey, we've already made this investment. Why aren't we leveraging the um, our internal associates? Or We've invested, and now they have 80% of the skills that they need for this job. Why not take it to 100%? Why not invest in their ability to build resumes, to communicate effectively in interviews, to give them that confidence so that they go through the process? We pulled them through to the job. And so I think you know measurement is key in terms of return on investment, but then also understanding what outcomes you're trying to achieve. And you can't emphasize enough, it's not the training for training itself or development for development itself, it's the mobility. It's the movement of your employees or your associates afterward. Hashtag jobs, Jocelyn, hashtag jobs. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go to audience questions in a moment, but before we close out the conversation, I wanna ask each of you to talk about any policy or practice takeaways that we haven't already discussed, um, as well as any final reflections you may ha have to share with the audience. Uh, Daniel, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Jocelyn. I'm just gonna jump in. Uh, I'm just gonna drop in to build off of the previous conversation, because I think that certainly all the internal at the firm level is really important. I think that there is a huge component to this, or to this conversation that you know, we haven't had time to touch upon today, but there's a narrative component related to the fact that there are some folks who are viewed as deserving and some folks who are viewed as undeserving here in the context of this conversation that is certainly part of this consideration. There's an entire policy component as well too related to the public workforce system not being oriented towards supporting good jobs, equity considerations. And I think you know Paul certainly knows this from um, his healthcare work as well. Certainly, if we look at where we have occupational growth in healthcare, we have large projected occupational growth amongst the jobs that are lower wage jobs as well. The solution to that is certainly not just, we're gonna train people to higher wage jobs, which we have less of necessarily sometimes as well, right? So there's a lot to unpack here on an ongoing basis. I think, you know, certainly we've talked about apprenticeship here. You know, that's a piece of our workforce system. That's one particular modality. There's a lot of attention given to that, but I think uh, there's certainly a lot of investment given to that as well too but as paul talked about when you look at the total numbers that's a relatively small slice of what happens as, in terms of workforce training as well and even with that i mean there are many obviously good components of it there are certain things that we need to pay attention to in the context of you know there's been an uptick in uh, the utilization of apprenticeship programs amongst some of these lower wage occupations as well so are we simply using a different modality to reinforce the occupational segregation that really exists i, I just think the intentionality behind what we're designing and building and what we're utilizing as centering workers is important in my estimation. So, you know, really appreciate the conversation today. Perfect. Kim, any final thoughts? 
So I think that uh, two things on the policy front, I'll, I'll speak from an internal policy perspective versus external. And when I think about it, organizations need to continue to look at their hiring policy. They need to continue to look at the skills versus degrees within their job description, um, doing job description reviews, proactively looking at internal talent like we were just talking about between the conversation with myself and Jocelyn. And I think the last thing I'd say as a final thought is we've had a strong focus on how do we help the management at varying levels. So someone talked about at the top, we can get all the buy-in at the top. We spent a lot of time with those um, middle managers or leads to talk about why this is so important to help people continue to skill themselves so that they're ready for not only being better in today's role, but in the future. And some of it was removing some of the policy that made it approval that managers were making. And so removed manager approval. To participate in programming, there's no longer a manager approval. This is a benefit, this is available, this is an opportunity for employees across the firm to continue to better themselves and their skills and their abilities to show up every day. So we have manager engagement. And, and that word alone made it about how do we bring together the manager, leader, and employee together to talk about as a part of not just I'm going to go take advantage of this program, but hey, it's a part of my annual performance review. I want to have this be a part of it because I am trying to better myself and we should talk about how you're going to help me as my leader to have this be a part of my development plan so I continue to get better. And we, we talk about that a lot. Jocelyn? I, I, I agree with what both Kim and Daniel have said in terms of closing remarks. The the only add that I would have is I think that um, we just need to bring to life some of the disparities we're seeing, some of the inequities that we're seeing um, by, you know, putting the data and analytics in place where it's it becomes a little bit more transparent and it's more dynamic and we can share it. You know, Paul, to your point about, you know, you having to you know, create your survey and, and there's not much data out there. So at the end of the day, you know, it's it's hard to, you know, voice kind of what we're seeing if we don't necessarily have the evidence and the data. So that's the only additional point that I would make is they, data plays a key role in this discussion um, to shed light and illuminate um, some of the points that we were bringing out today. Fantastic. Paul? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I would say two things. I mean, one is I think that uh, the panelists have been very sophisticated in talking about kind of how you kind of build, how you deal with internal obstacles. So, for example, you know, at the high level of um, abstraction, this issue about do you need a, a supervisor's approval to do training? No one, no one ever mentioned that, right? I mean, that, that kind of question doesn't show up in the literature. And it's obviously very important. And kind of getting down, and again, I don't use the word weeds in a pejorative sense, but getting down into the details of how organizations are structured and organized and figuring out that point, I think is very smart and very useful. I, I do think that the public sector uh, has kind of has punted. Uh, the amount of public resources that have gone into training uh, have declined over time. Uh, and, and the thing is that good training programs, I think, as, as Jocelyn mentioned, can, be, can partner with organizations uh, by providing both a, a pipeline into the organization, but also helping organizations support and adopt best practice for internal training. But those organizations, those external organizations need support. We know what best practice looks like, uh, but best practice has to be supported through uh, resources. Fantastic. Daniel, you talked a bit about sort of who's deserving and undeserving of these programs. And I wanted to use that as a transition into the audience questions, because we've had a number of questions about how to use apprenticeships or work race learning to help people with disabilities succeed in their careers, or maybe non-English speakers sort of move, move up in the corporate world. And I'm wondering how we can level the playing field for people who might, who might not have the traditional backgrounds that we think of. That's an important consideration. I mean, I know that there's federally a whole bucket of work related to um, increasing access for people with disabilities, as an example, an apprenticeship and making those more inclusive and accessible as well. I think that's really relatively nascent work still, and there's a lot to be figured out there. Um, but I know that is something that is a federal initiative. I think, you know, I, I really appreciate lifting up the 
um, the 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 language as well too, because I think you know certainly a big consideration for us. We work the workers that we work with, many many immigrants, right? Many different languages as well. In the context of the work that we do, it is really important for us and our partners to localize services, right? So training is provided across a range of different languages as well, right? That is not the norm per se, right? It is certainly the expectation that if you enter a training program, it is given in English and that you, you speak English, but that is not the, the tack that we take. Now, that requires a whole level of, of resource, as Paul pointed out, and infrastructure support as well, that is certainly not typical or the norm as well. But I do think it is really important if we say, we need to take a step back and say, listen, what we have done has not worked for many people to this point, right? So we need to reconfigure what it is that we're utilizing and what we're working towards as well. That is part of that process. And we need to, uh, as difficult as that work is, it is something that needs to be core to what we're working towards. Kim or Jocelyn, would you like to chime in? Okay. Um, all right, another question. Can panelists talk about how skills development addresses and doesn't address job quality and the large number of low quality jobs that we have? What else do we need to be doing alongside these skills investments? I think it's part of your overall workforce strategy. Um, and of course I would say this, but you, you need to, conduct, you know, job analysis. And, um, and you need to think about your associates as well as your business as you're, as you're doing that and understand, um, are we still keeping around, you know, jobs of yesterday um, versus recreating them um, for the jobs of tomorrow that are high quality, that are of higher quality. Um, and I think oftentimes organizations shy away from that and they have these legacy jobs that are existing um, and are not thinking about not only upskilling their workers, but what I call is upskilling their jobs to go along with it as well. The other part of that, I think that's important too, and, and couldn't agree more, and, and there's a ton of job architecture work that I know we've gone through in the last couple of years, but really looking across them, if you call it something over here and you call it the same thing over here, there should be equity across. And yes. Yes, Jocelyn. But I also think that one of the things that Paul talked about are the ladders, right? Or having these journeys for people. And so something that we've been trying to do is connect for someone. If I A and I want to be in role B, and I just, you know, clearly using a hypothetical. If you assess yourself on the skills and, and if we've done the architecture on that other role, which we've done it for over 500 of our roles, it then can marry together and say, hey, Kim, you're in this role. You're looking and wanting to be in this role. Here's some of the skills that you're going to need to get. And here's learning that can help you or suggested uh, things you should be doing to get there. So that helps someone to create that pathing. Because it's also difficult when you're in that frontline role to understand where should I go and what is the path I should take and how do I get there. Great. We have an audience question about work-life balance and i know that's something a lot of employees and employers have been contending with over the last two years and i'm wondering how that fits into all of this um how do you sort of prevent this from being you have a full-time job and now you're doing training on top of that you're doing workplace skills development and how do you keep from getting overwhelmed and still sort of having that right balance if i could comment on that as speaking as someone who has no work-life balance <laughs> um and I'd link it back to the earlier question. First off, there's something that we haven't talked about, which is that people should be paid while they're in training, right? And so uh, that that's I, I'm not I don't know whether that's an issue that applies to anyone on this panel, but certainly other organizations that might, you know, if you ask them what they do in terms of training, oh, we provide a tuition reimbursement program, but by the way, you're doing it on your own time and you're not being paid. Uh, the the earlier question. Um, had to do with job quality and kind of low wage, wage jobs. You know, I've spent my most of my career, a lot, a lot, a lot of my career, thinking about training issues and and working on that topic. But it's easy to forget that training's not the only tool in the shed in terms of improving job quality. There's other ways to think about job quality and upgrading the quality of work that's not about training, right? It has to do with compensation, 
It has to do with employee voice. It has to do with scheduling legislation around you know, predictable schedules. There's a lot of different ways to talk about improving job quality. Training and job ladders are certainly important, but they're, they're not the only, only thing to think about on that broader topic. Yeah, I'd like to just jump in real quick on both of those as well. So I think I appreciate what Paul just lifted up in both contexts. I think, you know, that was fundamentally originally why we were interested in registered apprenticeship. You heard me mention the fact paid job from the beginning. It was based upon the experience of healthcare workers. I've met one, many healthcare workers over the year. One in particular was describing to me a typical pathway that we put out there, CNA to LPN required this individual, uh, the training facility had to be in person, was located two hours away from them, had two small children. It was five days a week full time. So they had to work two double shifts in a nursing home on the weekend, go to school five days a week. That is an unsustained, we put far too many people in that situation. That is not a recipe for success or sustainable. And that's not fair to have that as the expectation that this is what folks must do. In the context of the second question, I mean, I would actually, I would say that we have far too long progressed along the path where we folk, we we have predominantly focused on training and skills development as they as the sole option for accessing a quality job, right? And I think that certainly, you know, Paul has done a lot of work with home health aides, right? And I think Paul rightfully would say that that is not the. Perhaps I'm wrong about this, but to me. That is not the training is not the primary mechanism towards improving the quality of those jobs necessarily, right? That is, you know, even if we are saying to people access a training pathway, we still have a great need for home health aides in this country, right? So what does it mean for those folks who are not able or do not want to access those pathways, right? But they choose to be CNAs or choose to be HHAs. They should also have a right to a good job as well. Perfect. Um, and one final question for you, Paul. Um, a, a viewer asks, what's the evidence for how employer-sponsored testing helps workers and businesses? What are, what are some of the data that we do have on how this can all benefit companies and individuals? Employer-sponsored training, did you say? It, it says testing, but I think it must mean training, yes. Right. Um, the, there's two, there's basically two sources of evidence on this. One is the kind of the internal ROI studies that Jocelyn referred to, which some organizations have done. But there are, while there's no good data on, other than my survey, on the kind of incidence of training across the whole economy, there is data on, for example, the National Longitudinal Survey of Young People, uh, which was done in two different waves. Uh, there's uh, kind of what you would call special purpose surveys in particular industries of people who receive training that tracks people over time, all of which shows, all of which shows econometrically, statistically, that uh, people who invest, who are, invest more in worker and employer provided training are more likely to receive higher wages and are more likely to be promoted. Now, the kind of, you know, give into a little jargon here, there are selection issues, right? I mean, you worry that the person who receives training is also someone who would succeed for other reasons other than the fact that they succeed at training, so the, that they receive training. But the best surveys find ways to deal with those selection problems. And I think that there'd be no debate that, it, you know, if you take two observationally identical individuals working in the same organization, one of whom was injected with six months of good training and one of whom wasn't, the person who was injected with the training um, would do better in that organization. I think the evidence is quite strong on that. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And with that, I'll bounce it back to Maureen. Thank you, Abba, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul, Kim, Jocelyn, and Daniel. What an amazing conversation. Uh, this has been a lot, honestly, to keep up with, I feel like, between the chat and the conversation and the Twitter. 
Like this has been just fantastic. Thank you all so much. I also want to thank my colleagues, Matt Helmer, Tony Mastria, Adrian Lee, Victoria Prince, Amanda Finns. Um, it uh, takes a whole village of us here at the Aspen Institute to put these things together. And so really want to appreciate them and their hard work in, in doing this. Many thanks to this audience. What a great audience you have been and really appreciate all the engagement, comments, questions. Um, that was just fantastic. Uh, please stay tuned for more information on our next conversation in this series that will explore how job how we design jobs to include and align with employee ownership. Um, I think that's going to be a really interesting topic and we have some great speakers we're reaching out to so more on that soon. Thanks for thanks for joining us today everybody. Hope to see you again. Bye bye.